everybody has to be born someplace, so I chose Haverhill, a small industrial town on the Merrimack River in Massachusetts. Well, I didn't actually choose it, nor did my parents choose it. We were all born here, so I guess, though I haven't lived here for 25 years or so, your hometown is always your hometown, and mine is Haverhill. It chose me. Here is a map of Haverhill from 1695. See how it hugs the river? Ten miles long and four miles wide, they used to say. Nathaniel Ward, a preacher from Ipswich, had a son, also a preacher. Now there wasn't need for another preacher in a town as small as Ipswich, so Nathaniel arranged for his son to get a land grant to go up the Merrimack River and start a new community in a land called Pentucket an Indian word for land of the winding river. And so it was that in 1640, John Ward and 12 desirable men and good Christians sailed up the river till they came to a stream which looked like a good place to have a mill. And that was Mill Street, which led up to Plug Pond, which held back the water, which was later to run down and turn the mill wheels. They signed a pact with two Indians Pasacoro and Sagahue. They agreed to sell 13 miles of land along the river for three pounds and 20 shillings. How could the Indians sell something that no one could own? That's a question yet to be answered. But the settlers began to clear the land, opened a record book, appropriated taxes, and started a village. They renamed the town Haverhill in honor of John Ward's birthplace in England. Here's the house they built for him. You know something of John Ward's leadership by the instructions he gave to his schoolmasters. Whatever else she do, maintain shame in them. More houses went up, a mill, and then because cattle were raised nearby, a tannery, and the town began to grow, and some of the settlers did very well for themselves. It must have been a lovely town in those days, looking down from the hills. Not many years later, they built a bridge connecting both sides of the river. And then, years after that, the railroad came. The railroad made a big difference, because now, not only was the city on the river, it was on the railroad, with connections to all parts of the world. With the railroad and the river, Haverhill became a center of commerce and manufacturing. They manufactured hats here. They made paper and boxes. They tanned leather. They even manufactured these great furnaces. But mainly, they made shoes. Millions of pairs of shoes. Haverhill was Queen Shoe City of the World. Queen Slipper City of the World to some. What a glorious time it must have been. Look at the river. There are no pleasure boats there. There are boats for carrying food down the river, for bringing parts up to the factory. There are boats for fishing, and there are even boats to bring the thousands of immigrants from Poland, Italy, and Ireland onto these shores to work in the factories. Here is a map of Haverhill from 1911, a growing industrial town with pictures of all the elegant mansions and large businesses along the top and bottom. Did you know that Macy's had its first store in Haverhill? In fact, the first Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade took place in Haverhill, though it didn't take place on Thanksgiving. Look at the houses these people lived in. Grand Victorian mansions with barns for the horses and tubes in the bedroom to call downstairs to the servants when you wanted breakfast. They lived like royalty, these princes of Factory Row. Why, even the schools looked like great mansions, and the children's home, a Victorian palace. And the stores, oh yes, the stores, such edifices of opulence. The streetcars drawn by horses pulled up. Or the horse-drawn carriages waited while the ladies went in and bought their silks and satins, baubles and bangles. Why, Emerson's store had a windmill on the top. Who knows what it powered, but that store was large enough that every Christmas they published their own catalog, and in the catalog they sold everything from china's sets to stoves. 
Yes, it was a time of opulence. One woman published a book called The Pentucket Housewife with recipes and advice for women. And there was an advertising page on the back with all of the gadgets that we needed for our newly born consumer culture. There was even a music publishing house, the Betsy M. Bickle Publishers, which published the songs of, you guessed it, Betsy M. Bickle. Here is an advertising card from the Colonial Theatre, the first theatre built by Louis B. Mayer, later president of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Many presidents have visited Haverhill. William Howard Taft needed a double chair to sit in. After all, he once got stuck in the White House bathtub. Theodore Roosevelt filled Railroad Square with people. Supposedly, George Washington stood on the spot where the old city hall was and said that Haverhill was one of the most lovely towns he had ever visited. I saw Harry Truman on a whistle stop here, and once in G.A.R. Park, I shook the hand of John F. Kennedy. As always, the wealthy did very well living in those elegant mansions, but not everyone lived that way. The workers lived in these traditional three-deckers that lined the streets of the working-class neighborhoods. Or they found an apartment house, or lived in an apartment over stores in the commercial district. These dual-purpose buildings lined Merrimack Street and Water Street and River Street. Sometimes the buildings they lived in looked just like the factories they worked in. Yes, the factories. Now it's time to talk about the factories. They look so romanticized in these old pictures. They were responsible for the growth, for the money. They made the city what it was. But they had their yin for their yang. Those smokestacks were pouring acids and chemicals into the air. Those pipes leading to the river were dumping waste, human and industrial. And think of the people who worked in those factories, trudging in every day before dawn, trudging out every night after sunset, day after day, week after week, year after year, winter and summer, icy cold in the winter, hot as Hades in the summer. They spent their lives in those factories. When I was a boy, my uncle took me on a tour of one of those factories, and I remember seeing a man at a punch press going up and down, up and down, his entire body up and down. And he turned to me and he shouted, Kid, don't ever go in the shoe factory. And luckily, I never did. We don't make shoes in Haverhill anymore. The depression and imports saw to that. In fact, in the whole country, we don't make much of anything. We write books and software and make movies. We sing and we dance, but we don't make much of anything. I don't know what to think of that. Recently, I came across a stack of old Haverhill postcards, many of them printed before I was born, when Haverhill was still a farm community turning to an industrial community. Many of them were of the river. The river was the spine of the city. It was the river that held our stories and our myths. People used to go skating on the river. The longest curve in the world was on the Merrimack River. All of the factories were built along the river, with the neighborhoods of workers rising up behind them. The river was a center of commerce, bringing in citizens from the old world. And mostly, the tributaries of the river kept the factories humming and the people at work and the economy growing. But mostly when I look at these old pictures, I think of how things have changed. The first post office, a two-story wooden colonial. And then, after the Civil War, this brick classical structure of the 19th century. Notice how the pictures trace the development from the horse and buggy and the streetcar to the day of the automobile. And finally, this behemoth of a federal building built during the Roosevelt administration, which kept hundreds of men at work during the Depression. Can you imagine the days when a man could stand in the middle of Washington Square and wave at pretty girls passing by? You wouldn't normally have to worry about getting hit by a horse and carriage, but you would have to be concerned about horse droppings. You could bicycle across the street without fear of being knocked down by a speeding horse cart, 
or you could wander aimlessly around the square and talk to people because you knew everyone. They were all friends. It was a small town. It wasn't long before the Haverhill National Bank went up. Seven stories. For many years, the tallest building in the city. And then the automobile came along and they lined the streets. And then there were double lines and traffic jams and trolley cars. Did you know that those trolley cars could take you all the way to Salisbury Beach? My mother says that on a Sunday afternoon, she and her brothers and sisters used to go down to Salisbury Beach and wander the long, lonely beaches and swim, and then ride the flying horses. Oh, some people call them the carousel or the merry-go-round, but we prefer the flying horses. So that's it. That's Washington Square. Buses came along and times changed. There used to be a lovely little park next to the post office, but it gave way to parking. There were 15 parks in Haverhill. I don't know how many there are now, but I doubt there are 15. Haverhill, like any other city, was divided into small cities, neighborhoods. Let's use those postcards to take a look at some of them. We'll start downriver and visit the Linwood Cemetery. That's where the first settlement was. Many of the earliest settlers are buried there. Soon we come to Buttonwoods, a large and stately mansion. There was once a Buttonwoods tree there, thus the name. It was there that John Ward gave his Sunday services before there was a church. It was there the men gathered to trade cows and horses and livestock and talk about the affairs of the town. It's now a museum containing many of the artifacts of the town, though it's fallen on hard times and could use any help you could give it. Further down into Riverside, we come upon the Siller Garrison House. Haverhill was on the outskirts of civilization at that time, so it was subject to attack by what they call the savages. High on a hill above the river, the people of the town could gather in this house and aim their muskets out the windows at the attackers. Riverside was also the location of the Hale Hospital, built on the outskirts of town to protect citizens from the mumps, measles, whooping cough, and other diseases that were the scourge of people in those days before antibiotics. Finally, we arrive at the Groveland Bridge, which takes us across the river and out of Haverhill. Now we'll take the river, down past the post office, past the outlet for Little River, over the bridge, and to the other side of town. First, we go past the Haverhill Yacht Club, and then down onto Water Street, which was not quite as pretty as it was portrayed on the postcard. Hike up past the Bartlett School. Finally, at the top of the hill, we'd reach a monument to penis envy, Tilton Tower. It was in disrepair when I was a boy and was finally torn down and replaced by a radio tower. The hill was where mainly Polish and Italian working families lived. My aunt used to take us up to the hill to the Polish church on Sundays because the masses were shorter and we could get that great black bread across the street. The only problem is everything I know about religion, I know in Polish. Look at those three decades and think about the lives that were spent between them and the factories. But there was a lot of family loving and good home cooking too. On the other side of the hill, was St. Joseph's Church. This was what we call the French Church. It was in the neighborhood of all the French Canadians who came down from Canada to work in the factories. Nearby, in the center of Lafayette Square, was a grand statue to that French hero of the American Revolution, the Marquis de Lafayette. The statue has been moved over to the side of a convenience store parking lot now. A few blocks up the street from Lafayette Square, we come to St. James Church, the Irish Church. Its grand tower came down when the church fell on hard times. It stands in front of the acre, 
an Irish working class neighborhood. There are no pretty picture postcards of the acre. The Winter Street School shows a change in philosophy. No longer the Victorian spires and arches. Now the school is a box to keep children in. Now we'll go up Main Street to the Gale Building. My aunt used to work there in the welfare office. I remember her telling me about some clients who kept snakes in the cellar. She was horrified, but I thought they must be kind of interesting people. The Walnut Square School was where my brother and his friends hung out and smoked cigarettes and talked about jazz. Going up Lawrence Street, we pass Round Pond. I used to go ice skating there as a kid in the winter, and there was an ice house over to the side of the pond where all the older kids would go to smoke and make out. Columbia Park runs down from Round Pond. I used to live there until I was seven years old when my father died. I remember walking to the top of the street and seeing a city sign that said, thickly populated. Underneath, someone had written, with Jews. Well, my father was Jewish, so I just nodded and agreed. I was too young to know that meant anything more than a population statistic. Now we'll go to the outskirts of the city, to Ayers Village and Rocks Village. This is where we'll find Whittier's birthplace. There are more postcards of Whittier's birthplace than any other location in the city. They have the only postcard that shows winter. After all, Whittier did write snowball. The sun that brief December day rose cheerless over hills of gray, and darkly circled gave at noon a sadder light than waning moon, slow tracing down the thickening sky its mute and ominous prophecy, a portent seeming less than threat that sank from sight before it set. In 1942, to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the city, they had a big festival down at the stadium. As part of the festival, they had a contest to see who could best represent the barefoot boy of Whittier's poem. My brother Bill, then eight, entered. I still remember him on the stage down in the football field with his rolled up pants, straw hat, fishing pole, and a piece of straw in his mouth. He lost, but I still think he was the best. Blessings on thee, little man, barefoot boy with cheek of tan, with thy turned up pantaloons and thy merry whistle tunes, with thy red lip red as still, kissed by strawberries on the hill, with the sunshine on thy face through thy torn brim's jaunty grace, from my heart I give thee joy. I was once a barefoot boy. I remember in high school, my friend Peter told the teacher that Whittier was only a mediocre poet. Well, she was an English teacher and she almost dropped her teeth. But you know, he was a wonderful abolitionist and he fought for the rights of the slaves. And he had a nice twinkle in his eye. But he was only a mediocre poet. This is an artist representation of the school that Whittier went to, as he described it. Those one-room schools weren't much to look at, but they sure did learn a lot. Rock's Village is almost the way it was a hundred years ago, though it no longer has a covered bridge. And now for a change of pace, we'll cross the river and go over to Bradford. Bradford was originally a part of Rowley, but it was annexed by Haverhill in 1897. It was a good deal for both of them. Bradford, a farm community, had lots of land for an expanding urban population, and Haverhill had money at that time and lots of water. Bradford was always a little more wealthy than Haverhill. You can tell that when you look at these shots of Salem Street and Chadwick Street. Bradford Congregational Church was so pretty that an architect took measurements of it foot by foot so we could build it elsewhere. Sacred Heart, closer to the bridge, was not quite as elegant, but served as many working people. But the jewel in the crown of Bradford was BJC, Bradford Junior College. Bradford Academy was established in 1803. It was made a woman's college in 1836. The girls at Bradford were different. They dressed differently, they spoke differently, they were rich. How we boys fantasized about what went on behind those windows. 
I once took a girl for Bradford out for a date. Her mother had told her to always keep her legs crossed. She did. When I picked her up, all through the movie, while we had a sandwich at Tuscarora, and on the way home, she kept her legs crossed. BJC girls obeyed their mothers. In 1971, facing hard times, it became co-ed just as the women's movement was taking off. The next year, it went to a four-year college, and in 2000, it gave up the ghost and closed. It was sold recently to the owner of Hobby Lobby stores and has been turned in to the Mount Zion Bible College. Boys no longer fantasize what goes on behind those windows. Yes, there was a river to separate us but there were bridges to bring us together. Good bridges, oh, not grand monumental structures like the Golden Gate Bridge, or lovely old Victorians like the Brooklyn Bridge, but good, solid, simple, substantial bridges. They were built to carry horses and wagons of hay, and now they carry construction vehicles and oil tankers, and I guess they'll keep doing it as long as we take care of them. But the real bridge that brought us all together was the schools. You can trace the history of Hazel and its schools. The Burnham, the Tilton, the Nettle, the Walnut Square, the Concertino, the Crowell, the Greenleaf. So many I can't name them all, but I know that whichever one you went to, you knew that that was the best. I think in those days kids liked school. Kids like to learn, and it was the center of their social life. Today, their social life is in the computer. Look at this card from the Cogswell School, how all these kids had written greetings on it. Good friends. I guess that was the Facebook of its day, though it seems a bit more personal to me. Finally, in the ninth grade, we all ended up in the annex, or what was more properly called the John Greenleaf Whittier Building. I fell in love in the annex. Oh, she was so beautiful. A small Italian girl. I used to pass her on the steps before third period. She'd be going down and I'd be going up. And then after third period, she'd be going up and I'd be going down. I don't know if she ever noticed me, but I knew she was more lovely than Helen of Troy. But then one day she was gone. I never saw her again. It was only a few years later I realized what had happened. She had got pregnant. In those days, when a girl got pregnant, she vanished. And then there was high school. Haverhill High School, with the thinker out front. Thousands of students passing by him every year. I wonder what he was thinking. You know, we had French, Italian, Jews, Blacks, all kinds. And in four years, I never remember a fight. Oh, there must have been some, but I don't remember one. I don't remember anyone ever talking back to a teacher. Oh, we had a disciplinarian, Mr. Evans, but when you did something wrong, like miss a lot of school or come in late, you'd have to go down to his office and sit on the bench in front of his door. That was the only punishment. Everyone knew you had to sit on the bench. Now in some places, cops come in with handcuffs to take them away. By the way, these postcards are black and white photos that are later hand-colored in other places, sometimes as far away as Germany, so they may tend to romanticize things just a bit. This is the commercial room where hundreds of girls learn secretarial skills. Once we had a career day, and 80 girls signed up to be airline hostesses, and three signed up to be secretaries. Some wise guy pointed out there were no airlines in Haverhill. Of course, we all have our fantasies. This is the auditorium, where I played the viola in the orchestra, acted in the senior class play, and stood up in Red Chicago in the poetry contest. Hog butcher of the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads, and the nation's freight handler. I lost. The high school library. Miss Tuck, the librarian, some kids called her the penguin, would give you a lot of help, but spent a lot of time going shh, shh, shh. The high school gym. 
I never did very well in gym because I never took climbing ropes as seriously as the coach did. This is a picture of my mother in front of the thinker about 1923. The yearbook called her Flapper Fanny. This was not a postcard, but I hope you'll understand. This is a picture postcard. Today, you're more likely to find the high school principal on the end of a noose than on a postcard. Mr. Pearson gave us a quiz every Friday. Miss Croston taught us about Shakespeare. And Miss, I don't remember her name, said that I wasn't ready for Latin. She was right. The library was only a block away from the high school. We would all sit around great oak tables there and do our homework and chat while Miss Pulsifer, the librarian, walked around going, Across the street from the high school stood the Elks Club, where men sat around and played cards and voted Democratic. My uncles were members of the Elks Club. My aunt was a member of the Emblem Club, the female auxiliary. That was the way in those days. They had female auxiliaries. And now we come to the neighborhood I've saved for last. My neighborhood, the Highlands. The Highlands was where the wealthy industrialists built their large mansions, many of them still standing today. Then the Depression came, and housing prices crashed, and those houses were turned into apartments, and that's how we came to be there. For me, the best part of living in the Highlands was that I was only a few blocks away from Plug Pond which led to the trails and the woods of 700 acres of Winnie Kinney Park. As a boy, how I loved to walk through those woods and trudge up that hill to Winnie Kinney Castle. We were told that Winnie Kinney Castle was built for, by a rich man for his young wife, but when he brought her there, it was cold and damp and she didn't like it, so he gave it to the city. It's not true, but it's good enough to be true. When we were kids, there were swings and seesaws there, but they were taken down as being too dangerous. There was a large deer that we used to climb, but that was taken away as being too dangerous. I have to tell you, a little danger in life doesn't hurt a kid. In fact, a scraped knee or a, even a broken arm can teach more lessons than a year in school. You used to be able to go horseback riding around the park here. There's one of the drinking fountains. But people used to fall off their horses and sue the city, so they took away the horses. What is it that Oscar Wilde said? And all men kill the things they love. And here's the pumping station, and I guess it's as good a time as any to talk about water. When I was a boy in grammar school, the teacher told us once that we were so lucky to live in Haverhill because we had five lakes and would never run out of water. The last time I went to Plug Pond, there was a sign, do not eat the fish, contaminated with mercury. But that's not all there was, because finally Haver was a city, and a darn good city to grow up in. So we'll use these old postcards to go around and have a look-see. I'm going to start in Monument Square, Within a half mile of Monument Square, there are uncountable monuments. Monuments to World War I, World War II, the Spanish-American War. But the thing I like about these monuments is that they are not of regal generals sitting on their horses, but of ordinary foot soldiers doing their duty. In between a couple of these monuments, you'll find the armory. The armory was where all the, what we call, weekend warriors trained but those weekends have stretched into years. And the armory is now an art center, which is fine with me. Across the street from the armory was the armory confectionery, where we bought funny books and cigarettes, and the firehouse, where we pitched pennies. Aside from a few variety stores and a couple of gas stations, Monument Square was mostly made up of churches. God, so many churches. Baptist, Unitarian, Universalist, Congregational. The one I remember most is the Congregational because I almost burned it down. I still remember when I was five years old, standing in back of that church, watching all the women 
with their brooms trying to pound away the burning grass, and my mother shouting in my ear, you're going to go to reform school. In German, the name Brenner means burner. Further down Main Street, past the high school, was the Pentucket Club. My mother and stepfather were members of the Pentucket Club. They had slate pool tables and bowling alleys where you had to be your own pinboy. Cross the street and go down by the park and you'll come to the old YMCA. Used to be every week we high school boys would have to go down there for a swim. We were required to swim naked. I think those rules have probably changed by now. And then we come to G.A.R. Park. G.A.R. Grand Army of the Republic Park used to be a social center of the city. It had a drinking fountain and benches. There was a Civil War cannon and a bandstand. But the automobile changed all that. Over the years, it's been chipped away at piece by piece till it's only a shadow of its former self. One thing that remained firm in the park, as in the character of the woman, was the statue of Hannah Dustin. The first statue ever erected in the United States in honor of a woman. In 1697, Hannah and her nursemaid were captured by Abenaki Indians. They took her baby and smashed it against a tree, killing it. Then they took her trudging up into the woods of New Hampshire. They were joined along the way by a 14-year-old boy, another captive. One night, when the Indians were asleep, Hannah and her companions took their tomahawks and killed ten of them. They took their scalps and wrapped them up in a sheet to take them back where they were given a bounty for each one of them. I thought that was a terrific story, till I read later on that two of the Indians were men, two were women, and six were children. Those were violent times. When you look at this monument to Hannah Dustin up on the hill where her house used to be, don't think of those rocks as being heads of children. One thing about Hannah Dustin, it's nice for the girls of Haverhill to have a role model. And then we come to the old city hall. Isn't that a gorgeous building? It went down with urban renewal. There is still some controversy in the city as to whether they should have torn down City Hall. But you know, I was there. It was very expensive to heat, impossible to air condition. The offices were small and cramped. The floors creaked. There was a theater upstairs for touring companies that no longer toured. And it was totally inaccessible. It had to go, but it sure makes a pretty picture. That's not to say that everything that went down should have gone down. They tore down everything west of Lower Main Street. It's as though they did it with a sledgehammer instead of a scalpel. In some countries, the government comes in with tanks and tears down your cities. Here, they come in with money. And Haverhill was one of the oldest cities in the country. Ah, Main Street. There used to be a Carboni's fruit stand on the corner by the bridge, and they had a peanut machine, and oh, you could smell those peanuts all through the block. And just down Merrimack Street a bit, there was a donut shop. Oh, how I love the smell of those fresh, hot, hand-cut donuts. You can't get them anymore. Now you get factory donuts in a chain store. In the donut shop, there was a sign that I still remember. As you wander through life, brother, whatever be your goal, keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the hole. It's been a philosophy that has stood me well through life. Merrimack Street was a shopping center with a Woolworths, some Mitchells, a Siva Spears. But what I remember most are the movies. The Paramount, The Strand, The Colonial, The Lafayette. The Paramount was where my aunt took me to see Shirley Temple movies, which I tolerated. The Strand had a strange mixture. The Colonial showed those MGM musicals, which were okay if they had Danny Kay in them. But the Lafayette, the Lafayette was my theater. I'd stand in line with 30 other kids on a Saturday morning with a dime clutched in my hand, waiting to see a double feature of Abbott and Costello, or Martin and Lewis, and Frankenstein, or Dracula, or maybe all of them together. The Lafayette was my theater. But my aunt never took me to the Lafayette. Just across the street from the Lafayette Theater 
was the Essex Firehouse. Now I'm going to tell you about the Great Haverhill Fire. It started at 3 o'clock in the morning on February 18th of 1882 in the Prescott Building. Flames moved along the grease-covered floors till they reached a barrel of shoe cement and exploded. A wall blew off with the blast, and heavy winter winds blew flames from building to building. The fire spread quickly. Firemen came from Newburyport, Lowell, Lawrence. There were 15 troops in all. But because the river was frozen over, firemen were unable to get enough water. The factories were wood structures, thick with oil from machinery and boots. The fire raced through them. The next day, the town was a scene of devastation. $200,000 in losses, 10 acres of factory buildings went down. Men who went to bed thousand years woke up penniless. The New York Times reported, Many disreputable persons came to town yesterday for predatory purposes, but the summary treatment of one man caught pilfering, who was beaten insensible by the citizens and police, made the plying of their trade extremely dangerous. Imagine those firemen, out on that icy cold night, fighting those raging flames. That's why they were all made heroes. Now we've come to Washington Street. Washington Street may be my favorite street in the city. Well, I owned a bar there once, but that's not the reason. When I was about three or four, my father used to take me into DeBurrow's Bar to show me off to his friends. They all approved, but that's not the reason. The reason is that when I was about 12, I used to go down to Railroad Square to visit my friend, Sam the Bookie. Sam was a big, heavy-boned, Semitic-looking man who lived with my Aunt Sally. He had been in the First World War and had a wound that made him wear a catheter, and my Aunt Sally was a nurse, so she helped take care of him. Sam hung out at Professor Bill's shoeshine parlor. There were lots of bookies in town in those days, and they each had their own territory. Sam's territory was Railroad Square, what he called the corner. Now, Railroad Square was a great territory to have. All the shoe buyers and leather salesmen coming into town, first thing they did when they got off the train was to go over to Professor Bill's for a shoe shine and to make a bet. Sam got arrested often and sent to jail. But they couldn't take care of his health problems, so they put him out, and next day he'd be back on the corner, taking bets. When I went down to see Sam, he'd always give me a quarter. Now that quarter was enough to take me to the movies, buy me a funny book, and get me the bus home. I used to walk home and read the funny book on the way. Saved a nickel. I guess the state has done a pretty good job of eliminating small-town bookies. But I'll tell you something. Sam used to take 10% off the top and give 90% back to the better. Now the state has its lottery. They take 50% off the top. I'm just saying. I think back now and wonder what it was I liked so much about Sam. But you know, everybody else's life was so boring and his was interesting. Here we are at the railroad station. As good a place as any to think about leaving town. But there's so much I haven't told you. I haven't told you about the Powder House. It's still up there on Powder House Hill, so you can go take a look for yourself. I haven't told you about the grave of the Countess. Whittier wrote about the Countess, and then so many people chipped away at her gravestone, they had to cover it over with this cage. But they kept chipping and chipping, and it's not there any longer. I haven't told you about the Dustin Garrison House. I don't know if that's still there or not. And I haven't told you about the Great Flood of 1936. Can you imagine the devastation that caused in the middle of the Depression? Speaking of the Depression, did you know that the First National Bank once issued its own money? I didn't speak about labor unrest. And there was some. There was a union. This is the headquarters. There were strikes. There may even have been a terrorist plot. 
a shoe manufacturer found a bomb in the entrance to his factory. But a picture showed that the wires to the bomb were never connected, and the terrorist plot may have been something else. A Catholic gave a talk at City Hall about how government money should be used to support Catholic schools. Angry Protestants gathered outside, and a scuffle ensued. I haven't told you how kind Hegel was to many of its people. This is the old lady song, where many of my grammar school teachers spent their life years. And here's the children's song, quite a building. I haven't told you about the joy of the seasons, swimming in Plug Pond in the summer, sliding down Windsor Street in the winter, the beauty of fall. I haven't told you about the parades and the celebrations, but we're back at the railroad station and my train is about to leave. Let me just say that I had a lot of joy growing up in Haverhill. I hope I've shared some of that with you. Ciao.